Ahi villagers want justice for death of young man. Westipik wants more revenue from log exports. And national planning staff make commitment to delivering results. This is the National MTV News with Meriba Tulo. A very good evening. Thank you for joining us. This is Tuesday's News. The leaders from six Ahi villages in Leh yesterday submitted a petition to the Northern Divisional Commander for Police, Peter Guinness, following the murder of a young man on the weekend. The young man was killed after he tried to stop a man from harassing two women at 8th Street in Leh on Saturday morning. Three suspects were arrested on Sunday and are now in police custody. Butibam youth also retaliated and burnt down houses at Banana Block, which they claim to be the residence of the suspects. This was the damage done on Sunday by the Butibam youths following the murder of one of their young men, Moses Wallow. Wallow was beaten to death by a group of men at 8th Street in Lay Town on Saturday morning when he intervened to stop a man from harassing two women. The Butibam youths retaliated and burned down houses here at Banana Block along Kasri Road in Lay. They claim that the suspects reside here. I'm not a lawyer. Even I'm not a relative lawyer. I'm not a staff lawyer. I'm sleeping in the back street. I'm sleeping in the back street now. I will start in fight until the town. I'm playing no cancer. I'm not a story of fight. I'm playing innocent. I'm playing stable. The killing within. The high leaders from the six I villages, including Butibam, Kamkumung, and Yalus, submitted their petition yesterday to the Northern Division Police Commander Peter Guinness following the murder of the young man. There were 10 demands petitioned by them, including the eviction of all illegal settlements police to apprehend all suspects in the killing within 48 hours and the shutdown of all liquor outlets in town. We have to hold to account people who make decisions while allowing one man to trade in liquor. At a heavy traffic thoroughfare will, man may be picking by going to catch him bus. There must be a designated zoning area for entertainment or the provision of alcohol. Now this will help where general public shopping centers commercial. Help where old mama are picking by going to buy him something like colorful bus. There must be no liquor outlet. Mr. Guinness, who was present to receive the petition, said the police have met most of their demands since Sunday. Three suspects were arrested. Police have closed all beer outlets in town and street vending within the city ceased with close police supervision. Guinness said Lake District will also engage police reservists to help police the city. The uh, member for Lay, uh, Lay Open has already come on board and we've already talked about setting up a reserve unit to assist the Lay City Council to police Lay City. So we're working on that now. This is the long-term um, uh, strategy that we will do to address, help address uh, uh, petty crimes in Lay City. We've taken, we've, we've taken control of uh, the major crimes happening in Lay City. There is no more major crimes happening in Lay City. It's the petty crimes that is creating more problem for us. So as a result of this, we witnessed one uh, death already. But we got these settlers just next to the town area. They come in and do anything and they just slip off into the, their settlements and then come a floods and we can't find them. So it's best that the Morobe provincial government with police. We have several notices, but they've given us the court order to stop. So we have to reemphasize on this one, get the order, and we start evicting those uh, illegal settlers uh, within next to the town township area. Julie Badui Oa, National MTV News, Lay. Over 140 teachers in NCD will have hours deducted from their pay because of absenteeism. The Teaching Services Commission came up with these findings through its monthly returns exercise rolled out last year to assess the attendance of teachers. Principal advisor for the appointment section, Maini Ugaya, said the commission has forwarded the names of 53 elementary teachers, 35 primary teachers and 21 secondary school teachers to the payroll division for pay deductions. Mr Ugaya said failure to submit teachers' monthly returns by the head teacher will see deductions of their responsibility allowances as well as performance-based salary allowances. He is urging parents, churches and communities to report teachers found to have been abs absconded from classes to the TSC on phone number 3013581. The Sundown Provincial Government is calling for an increased share in revenue collected from logging exports out of West Sipic. Governor Tony Wowo said after years of exports, West Sipic has nothing to show for in terms of development using logging levies. 
the governor also called on the national government to create a tax credit scheme similar to the mining sector for logging funds to be allocated for infrastructure development. Speaking during the official opening of the new West Sepik Forestry Office in Vanemo, Sundown Governor Tony Wowo appealed to the Forest Authority to allow the province for more participation in logging activities. The governor says for too long, West Sepik has remained silent on the matter and he wants the province to reap the full benefits from logging exports. The province has not been able to see the tingle, the tingle developments in areas of infrastructure and other social facilities. Pacific is the second largest province with a third of the country's rainforests. An estimated 52 million kina is generated annually from logging exports. This has prompted the governor to call for an infrastructure tax credit scheme for logging companies operating in the province. I am strongly suggesting that the tax credit scheme concept which would be the public private partnership or triple P arrangement task needs to be pursued now in logging affected province including my province or whatever province. His statements were supported by the provincial administrator who says there are many projects the credit scheme can help build. After 30 years of logging, what can you find in Vanimo Town? There's nothing you can see. We are only getting uh, two kina for per cubic meter on all the logs that have been exported. And basically this amounts to a very small amount of money. We can hold back about 25% of the money for infrastructure development. Meanwhile, Forestry Managing Director Tuno Sabuin says the government continues to pay timber royalties and landowners must use their shares wisely. You plan must look out them good money because you may not have it tomorrow by rain. Now you may like put the money in the pocket and pocket it broke. Stanley Ove Jr., National MTV News. The ABEC MSME and Innovation Summit concluded today in Port Mosby. The two-day summit focused on the critical contribution of micro, small and medium enterprises to economic development. The two-day summit brought together participants from the region's public and private sector, including MSME policy makers from the APAC region and leaders from regional and global organizations with strong MSME development programs. High-level discussions included advancements in technology and further participation of MSMEs in regional economies, harnessing said advancements. Recommendations will consequently be provided to APAC leaders. Because we really need to look at uh, in our fiscal response and our uh, policies, especially surrounding um, IT, we have got to make it very conducive so that, you know, our you know, Papua New Guineans and those who are participating in MSMEs and SMEs are able to grow and that the cost of IT does not become an impediment uh, to their business activities. And that, uh, and as I've said earlier, uh, we must create those opportunities. Uh, our fiscal and our policies must be conducive for growth. The summit is part of the Greater APEC SME Week. Leanne Girari, National MTV News. You're watching National MTV News. We go for a break now. Still ahead in the news, National Planning Department staff recommit to do more for positive results. Stay tuned for the details. Welcome back to the news. The opposition has raised concerns over claims that a state minister has been directly interfering with the affairs of the national airline. Shadow Attorney General Karenga Kua, in a series of questions in Parliament this morning, asked the Prime Minister whether he was aware of the perceived influence of State Investment Minister William Duma in the affairs of New Guinea. In a series of questions in today's parliament session, former Attorney General Karenga Kua raised concerns over the perceived manner in which they claim the State Investment Minister had directly involved himself with the running of national airline in New Guinea. Are you aware that the Minister 
rejected and disapproved the extension of the lease of two Boeing aircrafts, uh, which would have given a New Guinea a savings of 100 million kina over three years. Is the Prime Minister aware that the Minister's direct interference with the processes of the board and management of a New Guinea has this year led to a loss of 16 million kina directly? Is the Prime Minister aware that the Minister has interfered with a New Guinea's normal process of contracting fuel supply to all its aircrafts at the Port Mosby Jackson's airport? Which According to the opposition, the involvement of Minister Duma had created a perception of undue political influence at the state-owned entity. In responding, Prime Minister Peter O'Neill provided a brief outline of the changes that A New Guinea had gone through in recent months, including changes at the board level, which he said were facilitated by Kumul Consolidated Holdings as the shareholder of A New Guinea, but stopped short of admitting undue influence from the minister concerned. Uh, the minister certainly has got carriage over the responsibility of many of the state-owned enterprises, uh, but is, uh, certainly his briefs come from uh, Kumul Consolidated Holdings where when uh, organizations like Air New Guinea provide uh, annual operating plans for, uh, for, the, for the minister to take to cabinet for approval, uh, KCH uh, certainly uh, goes through those plans. And uh, if they find uh, that uh, these plans are unrealistic, uh, they certainly advise the minister and uh, certainly return uh, to the state-owned enterprise to redo the uh, plans as, as required by uh, the shareholder and the, and the minister. So there is a due process that takes place uh, before it reaches Cabinet for the annual operating plan for each organization to be approved. However, given the seriousness of the questions, the Prime Minister has assured Parliament that State Investment Minister William Duma would provide a detailed response tomorrow on the floor of Parliament. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I will. Uh, there are six uh, detailed questions, so uh, the uh, member could uh, give us those questions uh, in, uh, in writing and I will uh, certainly get the minister to uh, respond to him uh, tomorrow after question time uh, so that he can be aware of the uh, details that uh, he's seeking. Staff at the Department of National Planning have been urged to use this independence to reflect and do more as Independence Day approaches. The department yesterday evening held three pre-independent celebrations. National Planning Secretary Connie Samuel urged department officers to take their job seriously and to work to developing the country. The independence vibes could be felt amongst the staff of the National Planning. Happy Independence! Happy Independence PNG! Happy independence. The celebrations were also attended by the National Planning Minister, Secretary for Department of Commerce and Industry and Community Development. While there was much to celebrate as the department anticipates the launching of the third medium-term development plan, strong words of taking their job seriously was given by the Acting Secretary, Connie Samuel. I think this is the time. We are 43 years old. This is the time that we need to sit down seriously, seriously, we need to reflect. We need, to re we need to reflect on the path that we have come and start asking ourselves what has happened. Is the development impacts met the 43 years of our existence as an independent nation? These are fundamental questions that we all must ask ourselves. Look around. Look around the fringes of our city, the backwaters of our nation. People are still living the same way of life. Nothing has changed. Coincidentally, the Minister for National Planning, Richard Maru, also celebrated his first anniversary as the Minister for National Planning. <laughs> Minister Maru, in his independence message, thanked the department staff for delivering the third medium-term development plan, but said there was much to be done with the implementation of the plan. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. For all the work we've done, now many will tell you that's the easy bit. We have to walk the talk and make it happen. And we have four years to do that. Welcome to the real world. And we must do better than we've ever done in implementing 
the plane. Minister Maru said that another obstacle was holding the agencies that receive funding from the National Planning accountable. He announced the department's plan to set up an audit committee to ensure all funds are accountable. We're going to keep us all accountable to our new plan. We're going to audit all the funds that we transfer to all agencies. And I will rule with him, I'm telling all of you, we will no longer squander the scarce resources of this country. Under my watch. Adelaide Sirox Kari National, MTV News. A government delegation is in the New Island province this week for ongoing consultation on the review of the electoral laws. The team is led by Hanganofi MP and Chairman of the Constitutional Law Reform Commission, Robert Atiafa. Mr. Atiafa is accompanied by Rabaul MP, Dr. Alan Marat, University of PNG Acting Pro Vice Chancellor Administration, Professor Mange Matui, Reverend Dr. William Longa, as well as Electoral Commissioner Patilia Scamato, and Register of Political Parties and Candidates, Dr. Alphonse Gelu. New Island Provincial Administrator Lamila Pawood thanked the delegation for giving prominence to New Island by visiting the province and gave his assurance to work with them in the three day consultation. Simultaneous consultations commenced in West New Britain and Manus provinces as well. The schedule for the next leg of consultation for the Mumasi and Southern Region plus Hela, Southern Highlands and Enga provinces will be published in the media with a preliminary report expected to be presented to government at the end of this year. Turning overseas now and it's a monster storm growing stronger that has seen, been seen from an international space station. Evacuation orders have been issued in two states as Hurricane Florence bears down on the nation's southeast, now a Category 4 hurricane, but energy from warm seas could boost Florence to a devastating Category 5. It's set to hit North and South Carolina on Friday morning. More than a people have been ordered to flee the coast. While some are still basking in the late summer sun, mandatory evacuation orders means hundreds of thousands of Americans in Florence's firing line are getting ready to get out of her way. You can see people lined up at the gas station there filling up. I got a full tank of gas and I'm ready. <laughs> Even three days before the hurricane's due to make landfall, traffic's already backed up along North Carolina's highways. Some two-way highways reverse to go one way only, and that's away from the coast. Even the president telling people the warnings are no joke. We do know that we're in the bullseye. North Carolina is taking Hurricane Florence seriously. And you should too. Hardware stores reporting a run on plywood, torches, generators and tarpaulins. Hopefully we don't get a hurricane, but we want to make sure we, everything is covered up and ready to go in case it hits. Locals loading up with propane gas banking on inevitable power cuts. Sandbags too at a premium as people do what they can to protect their homes. Even if the storm misses us, I'm going to flood. Forecasters say winds at sea are already reaching 225 kilometres an hour. Predictions that Florence will dump more than half a metre of rain. And that's going to cause some life-threatening flash floodings. Making it the worst storm to hit this part of America's east coast in more than 60 years. A state of emergency declared in four states. The US Navy is evacuating its Virginia base, moving 30 ships, including two aircraft carriers, out to sea to ride out the storm. The first hint of the anticipated ocean surges already causing surface flooding on islands off the coast of North Carolina. Forecasters say Hurricane Florence is getting stronger and stronger out at sea. The concern is that once it hits the coast, its progress will slow down, maximizing the damage. So we're in for a real episode here. Florence's fury is coming. The hope is she doesn't linger. New Zealanders planning overseas travel have been warned to get travel insurance. They should also read all the fine print and tell the insurance everything about their medical history. The warning comes in the wake of a Hamilton mum's death in Bali. 41-year-old Abby Hartley fell critically ill last month. Her insurers refusing to pay monthly hospital bills or fly her home. Abby Hartley's brave fight is over. A give a little appeal for funds to airlift her home shut down, leaving nearly a quarter of a million dollars in unspent donations. Our Air Ambulance Service says it's a reminder travellers need insurance and need to be upfront about their medical history. 
you have to tell them about pre-existing conditions because insurance companies won't cover you for any complications that arise unless they know about them. Consumer NZ says pre-existing conditions don't rule out getting travel insurance, but can cost more. Once you get away and something does happen, you, um, you'll be very happy and thankful that you actually did pay the extra and get the cover. Even simple things like having your appendix or your gallbladder out 20 years ago, you need to declare to your insurance company. The appeal for Abby Hartley says the 41-year-old went downhill rapidly in Bali last month after emergency surgery for a twisted bowel. Her daughter Sophie posting after a very long and stressful battle with the insurance company, they've made the final decision not to cover any medical costs. From there, Sophie says medical costs kept escalating. We got an updated bill of $35,000 and today, due to the septicemia and antibiotics mum needs for 14 days, we got handed an extra bill for $40,000. Shane McGuinness says medivacing a patient out of Southeast Asia could cost as much as $200,000, but not all patients can be moved. Sometimes they'll assist in flying family members up to the patient, um, but it's certainly treated on a case-by-case -case basis. Tonight, Abby Hartley's family says she's finally at peace. It's unclear what will happen to the Give a Little donations. Nicole. Here with Tuesday's news, we go for a break. Now, when we come back, we take a look at stories making headlines overseas. Welcome back to the news. A young volunteer with the White Helmets Rescue Group was filming a bombed factory in Syria's Idlib province on Friday when he got caught in the middle of an airstrike. Wounded and bleeding, he still kept filming as his friends pulled him to safety. Rescue worker Anas Al Diab is shooting the aftermath of an airstrike. Moments later, more strikes hit. This time, Anas is the victim. His camera is still rolling, revealing serious injuries to his legs. Guys, guys, please come get me, he calls out to his fellow rescue workers. I can't move. The men tried to drag him to safety. Without so much as a stretcher, it is hard work. Another strike lands, pinning them to the ground. And another. They call for backup. Scenes like this are playing out across Idlib as regime forces begin an operation to take back the last rebel held province, raising the specter of a bloodbath. Russia provides most of the air power and claims that it only targets terrorists. An assertion that is contradicted by facts on the ground. Here, a woman's hand pokes up through the rubble, still moving. Rescue workers rush to free her from beneath the concrete. Eventually, they succeed, but it's not clear if she survives. <sighs> Anas was lucky. He made it safely to a hospital, though his injuries are serious. They are targeting innocent civilians, he says. They're trying to kill as many of us as possible. In spite of the risks, some of those civilians are taking to the streets again in scenes reminiscent of the early days of the protest movement against President Bashar al-Assad. Idlib, we are with you until death, they chant. They may well be the last words of this uprising. There's a new battlefront brewing between New Zealand and Wales. Not over rugby or the longest place name, but over a residential road record. In the Southern Hemisphere's corner, Dunedin's Baldwin Street is officially the world's steepest. Now, there's a challenge. 
A world away in a little corner of Britain, the Welsh town of Harley is home to a lung-busting road with a lung-busting name. Famed for its 800-year-old castle on the hill, this proud Welsh town wants another accolade. And this is it. The street, that is. Oh, Jenny, she's a bit of a, a, bit of a hulk. <laughs> you do this every day. Yes, I do, yeah. I need oxygen when I get home. <laughs> <laughs> I can see why. Locals say Fourth Pen Clech is one degree steeper than Dunedin's Baldwin Street and have asked the Guinness Book of Records to investigate. If it is the steepest street, it should be recognised as so, I guess. Uh, it's 36% and we believe that uh, Baldwin Street is 35%. So, yeah, this is a percent steeper. So. Certainly makes you puff when you're climbing, though, doesn't oh, it? It does, absolutely, yeah, every time. It's a killer. This road's really only for the bravest of most but it is still a popular thoroughfare because the schools are down the bottom of the road which means the school children have to walk up and down here in a day and the post office and the shop is at the top. It's even worse in icy Welsh winters but a world away Dunedinites are holding firmly onto their title for now. I mean they've got to prove it yet. It has become a very popular um, tourist spot. Some Welsh seem open to sharing though. I think we can both be congratulated for being able to walk up such steep streets. Would you say that yours is steeper? Oh, of course. I'd be lynched if I said something else. <laughs> so, with Baldwin Street's famous Jaffa rolling competition in mind, we conducted a decidedly unscientific comparison in the rain on live TV. And let's see how fast these roll. Attempt, wasn't it? <laughs> so could that be all the proof Dunedin needs to stay at the top? Well, it'll be at least 12 weeks before we find out. Officially, anyway. The calf muscles really hurt. The man behind the LifePod incubator, Sarah Avery, has laid a complaint against the news website and a harmful digital communication act. Newroom.co New Zealand says it stands by its coverage, but there are now questions why Sarah's chosen to use the act normally used for online bullying for his complaint. Surrey Avery's life pods made headlines in July with questions raised around when they'd be manufactured and delivered to hospitals. Now Surrey has taken aim at news website Newsroom over its reporting of this and other aspects of his work. We did a very substantial piece of work on him and his products and promises. Uh, it's been very measured and very balanced throughout. Sir Ray has gone to NetSafe with a complaint under the Harmful Digital Communications Act. Sir Ray Avery wouldn't appear on camera today, but in a statement described the coverage as a personal attack on his reputation and work. He says his wife has suffered emotional distress from the coverage and that he went to NetSafe as a last resort. There are other avenues for people who have problems with media coverage. Uh, the regulation, the regulator covering uh, the Media Council and the Broadcasting Standards Authority. The law states the act is to deter, prevent and mitigate harm caused to individuals by digital communications. Most times it's used against online and social media bullying and today some are questioning this approach. Did you imagine the act would be used in this way? Uh, no, um, there's obviously a purpose for the act and uh, if it is impeding the job of journalists then that is not uh, what, it, what the intent was but um, as I say we'll go and have a look at it and see what, exactly what it is. That um, is not my understanding of the intent of the bill. Sir Ray Avery's previously admitted to One News he'd not been clear enough or upfront about when his life pods would be Ready. And I apologise if that's if they misinterpreted what we're trying to do. If NetSafe can't help reach a resolution, the matter moves to the district court. Newsroom.co.nz hopes it doesn't get to that stage, but says it won't be backing down. Yeah, with National MTV News, we go for another break. When we come back, some sporting updates in Trukai Sports. Stay tuned. Sports. Welcome.
Welcome to Trukai Sports. We begin with Netball and City Pharmacy Limited. Today presented new uniforms to the Rebels Netball Club this afternoon at the Rita Flynn Courts. On hand to present the uniforms was CPL Managing Director Mahesh Patel. With the Port Moresby Netball Finals to be held this weekend at the Rita Flynn Courts, CPL presented the Rebels Netball team with new uniforms. Rebels Premier Division will face the might of the Sparrows on Saturday in the Grand Final. Rebels beat Mermaids 54 points to 51 in the preliminary finals last weekend, booking their spot in the final in the Premier Division. CPL has supported the team in providing uniforms and other gear for almost 30 years and Patel assured the club the partnership will continue over the years. City Pharmacy also donated hygiene products to Port Mosby Netball Association which will be given as prizes at the finals presentation ceremony. Elijah Levet, National MTV Sports. The 2018 National Schools Rugby League Championships kicked off today at the Oil Search National Football Stadium. The four confederations came together for the official opening of the three-day tournament. Three divisions will be taking part in this year's tournament. The boys under 16 and 18 and the girls open division over a period of three days. The three divisions were selected from schools affiliated to the PNG RFL. The opening ceremony was held today at the Oil Search National Football Stadium and was witnessed by PNG RFL Chairman Sandy Saka and City Governor Powers Pakop, other rugby league dignitaries and sponsors. The first match was played after the opening ceremony in the under-16 division between New Guinea Islands and Southern. Governor Powers Pakop was then given the opportunity to kick off signifying the start of the championship. New Guinea Islands dominated from the start, pressuring Southern's defence. NGI's hard running and fast movement of the ball saw them score their first try after 10 minutes. NGI ran in another two tries to lead 16-0 at half-time. In the second half, NGI maintained their lead, adding on another 16 points to win 32 points to nil. In the day's second match, it was a heated battle between the Highlands Confederate and Northern. The match went down to the wire, with both sides scoring one try apiece with failed conversions, saw the scores at 4 all. But Northern had the last say as they searched for victory, crossing the line in the last 10 minutes to score and eventually winning 8 points to 4. The under-18 boys tournament will kick off tomorrow, while the girls' open division will be played on Thursday. There will be no grand final playoff, with the winner to be determined after all teams play each other in a round-robin format. Elijah Levet, National MTV Sports. They may be the greatest of rugby rivals, but the All Blacks and Springboks are heading into Saturday night's clash on the back of two very different weeks. The All Blacks welcome a raft of experience back into the side, while South Africa continue to bring up the job security of their coach. No matter the politics involved in the Springboks camp, the All Blacks know one thing is certain. I mean, this is South Africa and they can play. Assistant All Blacks coach Ian Foster having to talk up the old foe, while one of his counterparts reiterated the dispensable nature of being the Springboks coach. We realise as, as, as coaches, as management, and this is driven by Rossi, that if we have to get fired for, for an individual loss or a series of losses, but we started a process that will develop a team that's competitive at the World Cup, that's what this guy is about. And if he has to get fired, and, and, and he represents it, if he has to get fired as director of rugby as coach, then so be it. It came a day after head coach Rassi Erasmus, who's only six months into a six-year contract, suggested his job could be on the line if they lose on Saturday night. But for now, at least, he's got the full support of the camp. We're aligned behind his, his, his vision and his goal. Um, well, so we wouldn't be sitting here. If I'm, if I'm not in that boat, I must get the hell out of here. The boat is a little steadier for the All Blacks, with a number of rested players back in the mix, including Ryan Crotty, Sam Kane and Rico Ioane. Sonny Bill Williams has been cleared for selection but missed today's training with sickness. Loose forward Liam Squires also expected to get the nod after a few weeks rest and will hope to pick up where Tasman teammate Shannon Frizzell left off. It was awesome to see him go out there and uh, implement it in the black jersey and it creates that uh, sort of competitiveness in the six jersey which is only healthy for probably him and I. And healthy for a squad chasing their final home win of 2018. And don't go anywhere, Trukai Sports will continue with more after these messages.
Trukai Sports. Welcome back to Trukai Sports. You've probably heard of Cool Runnings, the movie about a Jamaican bobsled team with no snow to train on. Well, now we've got Pool Runnings, the Tongan swimming team with no pool to swim in. It's clean and clear, but chlorine infused. These are foreign waters for Tonga's Ocean of Light Academy swimmers. And it's so warm. With a proper pool, hard to find back home, the 11 to 13 year olds have been training for the 15th Ames Games in the murky waters of the naval base at Nukualofa. We just got like these little ropes and you know, connected it from end to end. Uh, also don't have a proper coach, so you know, it's all our parents and they're just, you know, watching YouTube and learning on YouTube. Learning to tumble, turn and stay in a lane, just a mere technicality when you're dodging sea life in a roped off harbour. It's kind of funny watching them swim with you. Sometimes it's cold, sometimes it's warm and we're okay with that. The Tongan team's training took a hit with February's devastating tropical cyclone Gita. Life went on hold as their families rebuilt their lives. The house are destroyed and lots of the metals are inside the Never base, so we couldn't train in there before we might get a cut in our body. Within two weeks of Cyclone Gita, the team was back training two hours a day, six days a week. And they're not alone. 326 schools from around New Zealand and the South Pacific have been doing just that in preparation for what is Tauranga's biggest week of the year. Tonga swimmers have their own personal Kiwi cheer squad. They're not so young billets. Every time they said about Tonga, we all yelled, Tonga! So it's just something that we feel proud of them to be able to be supporting them all the way. So that's what it's all about. And whether they win in the pool or not, Tonga's team is already winning hearts here in Tauranga. The tennis and the battle lines are now drawn with tennis's governing bodies taking out opposing positions on the debacle at the US Open Women's Final. The head of the WTA backing Serena Williams' claims of sexism against chair umpire Carlos Ramos, while the International Tennis Federation is siding with Ramos, saying he acted with professionalism and integrity. This is just an example for the next person that has emotions and that want to express themselves and they want to be a strong woman. And they're going to be allowed to do that because of today. Maybe it didn't work out for me, but it's going to work out for the next person. Oh, no, no, no. Adding to the drama, an Australian cartoonist sparking an integrity Tense discussion around racism with this piece. Now cartoons are meant to push people's buttons, and this one certainly does, especially J.K. Rowling's. The illustrator has since defended himself, saying the cartoon is about poor behaviour and nothing to do with race. To cricket, and he started his test career with a century against India, and now Alistair Cook has ended it the same way. The former England captain hit a 33rd test ton before retiring from the game. It works like this. They stand, he delivers. Alistair Cook turning the fairy tale ending others imagined into his reality. Batting the way he's always batted. Through 80, past 90. Cook's aim seemed as straight and true as ever before. Nervous? Well, composure was lost by the Indian fielders. One run became five when the wayward throw reached the boundary and Cook was there. Past 100. In his final innings, his defining image. Fantastic achievement. After this, some may wonder why on earth he's now retiring. It's just time. It's time for, for me. It's time for my family. Um, and now it makes it even better. It's always, it's always nice people wanting you a little bit more than trying to kick you out. And to go out on your own terms makes it even better. Among those watching today, some who know him as Dad, a teammate who's known Cook his whole career, and those who came for one reason. It was history in the making, and I had to say, I was there. Cook eventually fell for 147, still looked disappointed. His career ended as it had begun, with 100 against India. And that story wraps True Kai Sports for this evening. We go for a break now. When we come back, the weather details for the next 24 hours. Stay tuned. Kai Sports. True Kai Sports. The weather details were proudly brought to you by Dulux. Celebrating 50 years in PNG and the only paint made in PNG.
A look at the weather forecast for the next 24 hours in the southern region. Port Mosby, possible rain with a top of 31 degrees. As, uh, cloudy weather in Daru with a top of 31. Rain and drizzles expected in Kerama. Rain and showers in Alata. Rain and thunderstorms expected in Popandeta over the next 24 hours. To the Mumasa region, a few showers expected in Wibak and Vanimo. Rain and showers expected in Madang and Wau. Rain and showers as well in Leh. To the New Guinea Islands region, rain and showers expected in Kokopo and Rabaul. A shower or two with a top of 31 expected for Larangao, Caving and Buka. And in the Highlands region in Mount Hagen, you can expect some drizzles over the next 24 hours with a low of 11 and a top of 22 degrees. 24 degrees and rain and drizzles expected for Goroka and Kundiawa. Rain and drizzles with a top temperature of 23 degrees for Mendi and Wabeg. A strong wind warning, a strong southeasterly winds of 25 to 34 knots with stronger gusts are expected to continue for the next 24 hours, causing rough seas. All small craft and boats are advised to take the necessary precautions before and after going out to sea. A look at the forecast for small ships for the next 24 hours. Waters of southern PNG Indonesian border through Torres Strait and Daru to Kiwai Island to Kerma, Yule Island and to Hood Point to Samurai Island and waters of Eastern and Western Milne Bay Islands and waters of Samurai Island to Cape Vogel to Finchafen and with waters of Manus in its western group of islands seas 1.5 to 2.5 meters waters of Finchafen through Vitias and Dampier Strait to Siasi Island to Long Island seas 2 to 3 meters waters of Long Island to Medang, Bogia, Uiwek, Aetape, Vanimo and the northern PNG Indonesian border seas 0.5 to a meter Waters of New Island to East New Britain to Bougainville sees 0.5 to 1.5 metres and waters of West New Britain sees 2 to 2.5 metres. And a look at the ocean forecast for PNG areas. Coral Sea, sea is rough with southeasterly winds at 25 to 34 knots. Solomon Sea, sea is moderate to rough with southeasterly winds at 20 to 34 knots. Bismarck Sea, sea is rough with southeasterly winds at 25 to 34 knots with gusts. And the Pacific Ocean, sea is light with east to southeasterly winds at 10 to 15 knots. The weather details were proudly brought to you by Dulux. Celebrating 50 years in PNG and the only paint made in PNG. And to end the news, a recap of our top stories this evening. Ahi villages in Leh calling for justice for murdered man. Wesipik wants more revenue from logging exports. And national planning staff commit to delivering results. And that's the new sport and weather for tonight. Tune in at 8 p.m. this evening for My Province, My Country as we take a look at the National Capital District. But for now, on behalf of the entire MTV News team from right around the country, present viewing, good night. <laughs>